Hey Zwifters, I'm Simon Schofield, and this is the Zwiftcast. Shane and Nathan will be with me shortly, but first we're going to talk to the first cyclist to land a pro contract through a contest on a virtual cycling platform. Truly a moment of history. Leah Thorvilson is looking forward to life as a member of the Canyon Shram Pro Cycling Team after making it through the final selection process at the team training camp in Mallorca last week. She was one of 1,200 riders who entered the Zwift Academy. Just like a long road race, it was a process of whittling down and attrition. 1,200 became 12 semi-finalists, the breakaway if you like. Three riders, Leah, Jesse Donovan and Yvonne Van Hutton struck out from the breakaway for the final and the one to cross the line first in the sprint was Leah. I caught up with Leah shortly after she left Mallorca. She'd not had much sleep and she was still pretty shell-shocked. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> I, it's, it's, um, yeah, the first Cat 4 Pro ever, I think. <laughs> I was shocked. I was speechless. I really, I don't even know. I mean, I guess, I guess you could say convinced myself, but I just, I just believed I had, had found solid reason to think that either of the other girls would be selected over myself. And um, so I was, I, and I was at peace with it. You know, I had a great week, um, amazing experience. I learned a lot. I mean, as much as you can learn in that short of time, but I, I definitely had some some advice from the girls that I knew I would take away and, and had seen a little bit of inside of the life of, the, of a pro. And, um, and I was, I was content, you know, I was, um, I was very at peace with, this is going to be a night to celebrate someone else. <laughs> so I kind of found myself at a loss for words, which as you know, is strange. So, um, Leah had mentally prepared for failure, but not success. From the beginning, I had thought it was such a long shot to ever make the final three. And if I did that, once they saw, you know, the things that I needed work on, they'd be like, um, yeah, you can't be a pro. But instead, they saw this great potential. And it was just I didn't at all have my mind prepared for that scenario. I mean, and it was it's, it, you know, obviously, like I said, very exciting, but it was just I think speechless because not that I would have planned something to say anyways, but I just had never sat and really thought too hard about how am I going to react if I'm selected. <laughs> 12 hours after the announcement, Leah has had a little time to reflect on what it all means and how far she's come. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of exciting. <laughs> I've made history. I don't, I don't know that I care um, about being famous, but being able to do, I think what, what I, in the regard of having a person out there at all, that, that proves that you can do something that people wouldn't think is possible. And now let me be very clear that I don't think that I've come from starting this program in June and that I am at, um, or even near really the talent level of the women who are already on that team. But the fact that I could develop myself in that shorter time from a new rider to someone who they see as having the potential to go and ride on a pro circuit is pretty incredible. It's a huge life change. Will she be moving from America to Europe? I have a very happy relationship that, you know, I said from the get-go, I, I told my boyfriend, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this if, if it means that, you know, I'll lose you. And I, I don't, I don't, he's got two daughters and that he wouldn't, you know, moving to Europe wouldn't be an option. So there'll be an extended period of time that I'll have to be there at some point, but, um, but it won't be permanent. Um, and as far as has it sunk in what this is going to do for my life, um, it hit me pretty hard <laughs> about 3 a.m. You know, your head's kind of in a fog and celebrated, you know, had had a few glasses of wine with it with the other uh, girls last night after all the meetings and such were, were through. Um, and it was just kind of, you know, lost in, in the moment. And uh, and I I didn't get to lay down until about 2 o'clock this morning, and I had to be up again at 4.30 or at, no, 1 o'clock, and I had to be up two and a half hours later. And my, you know, your mind just starts turning. And I was just thinking, what's going to happen with, you know, where the initial reaction was all the things that are wonderful and exciting. And suddenly it's like, 
what am I going to do to make a living? What am I going to do? Because, you know, women's cycling it has, has a ways to go, even if you're the best of the best as far as, um, as what you pay. And, and for someone who is, um, uh, uh, a a pro- a development project it's let me i'll just i'll just say it's a, it's a, it's a less than it's it's a highly desirable career with a less than desirable salary <laughs> so yeah i mean I, it it literally I, i've said i think it i think it'll be about an 80% pay cut for me and the next day leah got a taste of at least one aspect of life as a pro bike rider I got to the airport this morning and couldn't carry my bags by myself and, you know, in a foreign country and I speak enough Spanish to get around, but I just suddenly felt so alone. And I thought, this is something I'll have to get used to. You know, you're traveling with luggage and you've got a bike and you're trying to <laughs> find your way. And it's just, uh, it's, I, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's intimidating. It's very, it's very scary. And, um, yeah, it all happened so quickly that it's, it's just, it's crazy. It changes the dynamic of, of everything about cycling for me. And I mean, what a great adventure and what an opportunity. And I, I certainly feel blessed for sure, but it's, it, it's very scary too. <laughs> Here on the podcast, we've been lucky enough to follow Leah's progress closely. She's been a guest after qualifying for the semi-finals and for the last three. She's a determined, committed rider. I think once the shock wears off that she'll do very well. What an achievement. Congratulations, Leah. Oh, well, slightly delayed by that breaking news from Zwift Academy, but here they are, the dangerous duo, Nathan Guerra. Yo, dude. Hey, how's it going, Simon? Pretty good, thank you. And live from Melbourne, Australia. G'day, mate. Shane Miller. Hello, hello, Simon. How are you doing? Uh, very well indeed, thank you very much. Well, literally about an hour after the podcast was published, iOS was was released, which, um, yeah, I was very quick to, to immediately claim credit for the, it was the podcast, what done it, but I, I, I actually don't think it was. Um, and predictable kind of influx of new Zwifters after that, um, but one major surprise, which was the inclusion of Zwift running as an Easter egg within iOS. Shane, Running, good thing or bad thing for us cyclists, he said in a very parochial fashion. The community is amazing. I've got to say that. They are an amazing bunch of people. They found it within, I think it was only a few hours. I really think that it only took them that long. But I'll tell you what, the first time I saw a runner on Zwift, I felt a sense of welcome. I don't know. It might be just me, but that's my take on it. I'm like, awesome. Somebody's out there using this environment. And I've said it before, I'm, I'm pretty um, pretty positive and upbeat about yeah, the future of this platform. Um, and I saw someone running there and I just thought, you know, welcome to the environment. You know, welcome along. We're all in here you know, getting fit and running along. Um, so when we see bunches of uh, runners running along, I think we're all going to feel that. So um, warmly welcome the runners. Yeah, yeah, me too. Absolutely. I mean, it's always good to see people not on the couch. I mean, I'm just not a runner. I, I, you know, I'll be quite honest. I, I, I don't like running. Actually, I, I hate running. But I, you know, I like runners. I do like runners, and it, it, it will be good to see them on Swift. I suppose the only concern I had, Nathan, and it might be a bit of a parochial concern, and it might be a bit of a selfish concern, was that development time might be spent on running when it could be better spent on cycling. I was thinking, how many runners are out there? Those turkey trots and like, that is a, that's a pretty big market. And all of a sudden that market starts coming in and taking over. It's like, oh, we really need to develop things for these guys. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh uh-oh, where's this feature, that feature. And so, but anyways, I mean, bringing in more people though, brings in more developers. So growing as a platform is good overall. I think this is a definite uh, tide rise in situation. Situation. And I, I, I don't think it's going to be um, in any way harmful at all, whatever, to the cyclists, bad for cyclists. Uh, I think it's actually only going to grow the platform and give us all uh, more of what we want, which is more Zwift. Uh, no, I, th- I, I, th- I think that's right, actually. And, and I, I did ask Derek, uh, Derek, <laughs> I did ask Eric directly um, whether runners were going to going to take time away from cyclist development, and, and he said no. And you know, w- we know they're expanding the development team, so I, I think we're probably, or I'm probably wrong, wrong to be worried about that. D- do you actually run, Nathan? Are you a runner? Do you do any kind of cross training as running? 
I used to in uh, high school with hockey and karate as like a supplement for cardio and stuff, um, but not so much anymore. I ran a little bit uh, prior to cycling and had a little bit of knee stuff going on because I would run a lot uh, outside on the roads and I just couldn't get the trails much anymore. Um, Shane, do you, do you run? I, I don't, but I did because they gamified it. So I wanted to check it out. I wanted to see what the experience was like. And again, I wanted to test the boundaries. I joined a bunch ride as a runner. And I just simply walked out the front gate, walked off the pier and walked down the road. And everyone's like, what the hell, Lama? What did you just do? <laughs> I've always been a fan, frankly, of sitting down sports. I used to do a bit. <laughs> I used to know I used to do a bit of rowing, rowing. With, and I was going to mention I rowing. I loved rowing. I loved rowing. But you could, the thing is, you can sit down with rowing. So uh, and you can sit down with cycling. So sitting down sports, that's what I vote for. Well, time trial, so I'm almost laying down. It's uh, even lazier. <laughs> What's really interesting to me with the introduction of running is the immediate changing landscape in the community because of it. There's already a Zwift Runners group. There's a scheduled group run for Saturday, I think, already. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so it's this whole new uh, world and community of people that's going to bring their own dynamic, you know, and, and the landscape immediately changes as you bring new people in and new user group in, which is really interesting and fun to see. Yeah, yeah. Welcome Swift Runners. Officially welcome Swift Runners. Um, now, the other thing to follow up, uh, the other new things to follow up, and I hope I, I, it doesn't sound as though I'm being unfair on tax here, but, you know, this was a massively eagerly awaited trainer and uh, the flux... You know, there were so many kind of hopes pinned on it that it was going to be a kicker killer and the Neo has been wildly successful and here was a kind of cheaper way into some of the great technology in the Neo. But Shane, I mean, it has been a difficult birth, hasn't it? I mean, you broke yours, a pretty well documented lag in power, which is really frustrating on Swift. And um, I I've seen a new problem reported, which is... After a, a period, five or six minutes at, at, well, not high wattage, but, you know, somewhere around 240 watts or over, um, there are reports of the trainer completely dropping connection and no resistance on the unit. Now, normally you'd look at a problem like that and say, uh, just take a look at your setup guy. But but, but um, I've seen a report of this where he can replicate it at will, which which suggests that, you know... Uh, there could be another problem here. This has been a difficult birth of a new trainer, has it not? They have had teething issues. Um, and it is a bit, of, a bit of a concern as well. Now, everyone nowadays, we probably see more of the uh, issues than the success stories because people now have mobile phones that can upload very quickly and very, very instantly like to YouTube in high res and high sound and high audio. So we rather than just someone saying, oh, I've got a little bit of an issue in dealing with... Um, the tech support in the background, they're straight on YouTube. Um, I've been with that with mine um, and I've had, I've seen about five other units with a similar issue as what my first unit had, which is really concerning to be honest. Um, but having said that, um, they've got, they've sent out the new firmware for me to test on the new unit, which arrived 25 minutes ago on my front door. Um, so again, I'm trying to remove all emotion from it and just use the data and fingers crossed the flux redux is going to be a lot better. Yeah. And, and we must be fair to tax here. I mean, they've jumped on the firmware issue very, very quickly. Indeed. I know that, that, that people that I know within tax, uh, are on the, the flux users, uh, forum on Facebook, giving one-to-one -one technical advice. I mean, they're showing every signs of being very concerned to get this right and as you just pointed out a, a completely correctly we only ever see the problems on the internet and on social media we don't see the satisfied customers the, the worry for me though is that there is a pattern here you know there's a pattern of 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 a an error in manufacturing or or, or some issue some problem that um it is not a one off you know it looks as though it's kind of systemic which 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 must be a concern for for tax it must be yeah, the first thing they said to me when they heard of my squeaking issues, they said, yeah, box it up straight away. And I didn't. I kept writing it, and that's where it broke. So that's that's my, that's on me for that. Um, but this new one, they've just said, here's the brand new one. We know what's going on with the unit. Here's the new one. So being the sort of inquisitive person that I am, I'm not going to build it. The first thing I'm going to do is take it apart. 
I'm going to see what's different in this new one and just have a bit of a squeeze around and have a look and uh, and then put it all back together. Hopefully uh, not miss any screws, but put it all back together and uh, and then start writing it. But look, I'll be even more critical of this one because if this is the replacement unit. I don't want to have to go to the third video on this, which we will call Tax Flux Reflux. I have to say, uh, we did have a little bit of fun on uh, a private message just as we were setting up for this podcast. Uh, Shane's connection dropped and he did message uh, Nathan and I and saying, uh, my connection's fluxed. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the new slang, but uh, no, that's all just a bit of fun. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> exactly the bike through. <laughs> uh, Lisa, I, you know, I hope Tax sort this out. They're a good company. They make good products. It's really good to know they're listening to us Zwifters as well. So everybody listening here have direct access to us. They can ask us questions and we're feeding this back to the companies direct. We're putting these things through the paces for exactly the way people are going to be using them on Zwift, chasing wheels, doing time trials, doing sprints. Um, so for tax to actually listen to us and not just sort of brush us aside and put us in a queue of troubled, troubled users, it's been really good. So I love that response and I love the influence we can have over these devices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, much as though social media forums can be destructive might be too strong a word, but they can be kind of they can disproportionately represent problems. They are also a fantastically direct channel for getting to companies and, and making them listen to, to things that they need to be listening to. So, uh, you know, let's hope social media, good and evil, balances its, itself out on an issue like this. Lots of new Swifters. I mean, it's 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 easy to see that iOS is having an effect, and I think we've seen the evidence of that. But we have seen, or I think I've seen, just a bit of tension around the main forum, Swift Riders, um, with, I don't know, it might be my imagination, and I'm really keen to hear from Nathan on this. Uh, is there a bit of a kind of two tribes thing here, Nathan, where... The, the veterans who who have been around quite some time now. I mean, if you're on the beta right at the start, it's it's like over two years. So there are some some kind of horny-handed uh, and possibly even short-tempered veterans um, who are getting a bit kind of fractious with questions and issues brought up by by new riders. Uh, was there a bit of tension around Nathan? Do you think? I think that there is a, a little bit, definitely. Um, like you said, there's a lot of people who've been at this for two years. And the initial people coming in are already going to probably be fairly tech savvy, too. Like They're going to know that there's this new platform out there and want to get involved and know how to register for a beta and all this different stuff. And so I think that those people already maybe had... Uh, a little bit of an upper hand in the tech. Right from the get-go, though, on the Facebook with Zwift Riders, I mean, there was even, I don't know what it is about the, the get with the program here, buddy. Why don't you know what's happening here? Kind of an attitude. And and for those who are savvy to it and kind of understand that it's kind of an initiation hazing process that's fun for some, <laughs> you know? That, I mean, and I'm all about that. Like, I'm all about, like, okay, let's initiate in a way that encourages people. Initiation mm. processes are supposed to be a rite of passage a little bit and not a get with the program, you jerk. What do you figure this out already go whatever read the pin post is like in use the force luke you know from obi-wan at the top and that's a joke and it's fun and so the initiation process should be tongue in cheek fun and not like totally smack in the face it shouldn't feel, feel like a smack in the face and so i'm a little bit like come on guys like we've been here for a while there's a lot of new people coming in let's be nice sure let's Let's initiate the noobs, okay? But at, at, but let's do it in a way that makes them feel like they're suddenly a part of a community that just has fun and jests with each other. Just know that we're a lot of a lot of those that are in the Zwift community that have been here a while are really really do welcome the new um, newcomers in, and there is a little bit of that having fun jesting with each other going on in the background uh, as well. So yeah, and it's important not to get this out of proportion. I mean. I say tension. I mean, that you know, Swift Riders is not quite a kind of open warfare yet, but uh, there has been a there has been a tiny bit of tension. But also, you know, I I saw a post the other day, and it was such a lovely post. It was so refreshing. It was somebody obviously a complete noob, but they'd solved a Bluetooth problem with 
by the, this product, which apparently now is incredibly short supply, this 4i product, which is a, an ANC plus uh, Bluetooth bridge. Apparently you can't get it for love nor money. Anyway, she'd, she'd, um, she'd, she'd sold it and she was non-techy and she just came on and described how she'd sold it and what it had done for her and how much she was enjoying being on the platform as a result. And here's a tip, guys. This is what worked for me. It could work for you. And it was a really, really lovely post. Um but on the flip side, you know, I, I, Shane, I mean, there's been a bit of kind of almost deliberate trolling, actually, in, in Swift Riders as well, hasn't there? which is, is wrong, really. One or two posts that I've seen recently where people are actually initiating a post with a troll. I mean, you can sort of have a bit of fun later on if someone doesn't quite get something and you know the vibe of where they're going and their level of understanding. But if it's an initiated uh, post just to troll and just to bait, it feels really tiresome that um, you know there's energy and people are actually reading those as sources of information. Um, and if it's misinformation, we then have to go back and clean that up later on if they come back with wrong information. So I think we just have to be really responsible and just be mindful that people come from all different walks of life and different um, understanding of the English language, which we all talk in there. Um, and I definitely get that across my YouTube comments as well. There's some really interesting comments that I have to really think about. and like, oh, oh OK, you know, then English is not their first language. So we've got to be really clear just to help everyone out. But uh, I still think it's a, it's a worthy place to subscribe to. I'm sure this... This, this sort of tension thing will will settle down in time. I'm absolutely, absolutely certain of that because it is a positive community. It always has been, and there's no reason it, it shouldn't continue to be one. Uh, oh, that was a bit preachy, wasn't it? Um, OK, well, let's, uh, let's, let's move on. Now, I went to Italy, uh, what is now a couple of weeks ago, and it, this was for a factory visit at Elite. And... Um, I'll just do the T and C's bit here, uh, just so listeners know. I'm not making a big deal of it, but I I paid my own way. So um, uh, I actually went out for dinner with the elite people, and they paid for my dinner, which I just thought was um, uh, a, a nice acceptance of of genuinely offered hospitality. But I paid my own way there, so I'll just get out of the way get that out of the way because it, it can be important for people to understand that. Um, but anyway, I went I went to Elite and they make uh, the, the big trainers they make for Zwifters are Drivo or Drivo, Rampa and Cura. And actually, I'm hoping to get to all of the factories over the next course of the next few weeks, um, all the big trainer manufacturers uh, and, and pay them a visit if I possibly can. Anyway, uh, I went to Elite and here's the first of a couple of reports in this podcast. <laughs> So here we are in an Italian bar the day after the referendum uh, wreaked political uncertainty in Italy, not for the first time, uh, and we have a fully-fledged Italian political crisis on our hands here, which is what they're talking about in this bar. And that's a fairly frequent occurrence in Italy. And not something to trouble us too much, because we're not here to talk about politics. We're here to talk about something much more important turbo trainers. So I flew into Venezia, or Venice, and drove around about an hour north, right into the heart of a region called Veneto. Now Veneto is a really interesting area in Italy, particularly if you like cycling, because just about every major Italian cycling brand, Pinarello, Campagnolo, CD, and hundreds of others, are based in this region. It's the real heartland of Italian cycling manufacturing and Italian cycling companies. And it's no surprise that Elite, the makers of turbo trainers and bottle cages, are also based here. And here we are at Elite. Uh, nice surroundings, lovely old historic building with two interesting looking towers on the roof which we'll find out about when we go inside. The towers turned out to be chimneys from an old lime kiln which was the original use for the set of buildings now occupied by Elite. At this point it's probably worth explaining how Elite works. There's no assembly of trainers at the HQ. The company relies on a network of local factories and contractors, all within a 25 mile radius of their head office. They're all specialists in packaging, assembling, casing and other skills. Elite own or part own some of these businesses and others get up to 80% of their trade from the trainer company. So it is very much a local business. Elite experimented with Far East manufacture, but abandoned it, and the company was pretty frank with me, describing it as disastrous. 
So the head office looks after software, product research and development, quality control, warehousing and various back office stuff. About 50 people work here and there are perks. So we're here in uh, a part of the elite building which looks like fun for the people who work here because there's a number of elite trainers set up here in front of nice big TV screens with fans, a lovely area and is used by the staff as a kind of uh, small gym and training area. They obviously ride their own trainers but not all the trainers in here are elite ones. So walking around this little area, there's a workbench with uh, various trainers stripped down. And underneath the workbench, unsurprisingly, there's a couple of Wahoo kickers and a Neo Smart. As you'd expect, the guys here at Elite are clearly keeping a close eye on the competition. And Elite think they've got the competition beaten with their new flagship trainer, the Drivo. We can get an explanation of the thing that's at the very heart of the Drivo and makes it so attractive to people, which is its incredible accuracy. Uh, and I'm here with the chap at Elite whose baby, I think, is, the, is this system called the OTS. So, uh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Alessio Pizzetti. I'm an electronic engineer of uh, electronic department of Elite. The core of this the sensor is uh, uh, a particular spindle in a, uh, a particular steel. This uh, spindle, when the cyclist push in the pedal, the spindle have a deformation. The deformation of the spindle is linear and attached to it are two rings. Uh, this, uh, there, is, there are two senior rings with uh, uh, 11 teeth and uh, when the, the, there are a deformation uh, the, the teeth uh, increase or decrease the distance uh, between. A laser is fired at the teeth hence OTS or optical torque system and the minute changes in distance are measured. That produces around 300 pieces of data a second all of which is crunched by the proprietary algorithm and all of which produces class leading accuracy. Elites say plus or minus 1%. In reality, it's nearer 0.5% or even better. I'm with Peter Largo also here, and Peter is uh, the marketing guy at Elite. So, Peter, um, this technology, is it Elite's? It is a technology that was existing, uh, a German technology. Uh, we have the exclusive rights, and uh, what Alessio, uh, let's say, the you said his baby, his job was integrating this system, which was proven very accurate within, within our trainers. Our mission was to have something super ultra accurate. How far can you extend this technology, Peter, into what other models are you looking to extend this? And are you looking to extend this technology into models further down the price range from the driver, which is at the very top at the moment? The plan is to find a way to integrate it into lower price point models moving forward uh, because we did see the reaction from the market this year uh, that was well, well, well perceived and uh, there's more and more uh, mainstream uh, clients demanding a precise uh, training tool. So it's, it's Alessio's job and the R&D job today to, to find a way how to uh, integrate this system into even lower price point trainers. Peter, you've been, you've been very open ab about the OTS system. I mean, there's been videos posted online. You, you're completely open here with me with a, with a stripped down trainer showing exactly how it works. And, and clearly this design has a patent attached to it and you have the license to it. But how aware do companies like Elite, when they're working at, at the edge of technology like this, how aware do you have to be about the possibility of a system like this being stolen. I mean, I mean you hear of, of IP being stolen the whole time, particularly in high-tech industries, and, and, and the servo trainer industry now is, is a high-tech industry. Yeah, Simon, well, that, that's a good question because through the history of our company, we, we've had plenty, plenty products copied, uh, not just uh, with our trainers, but also you saw we do other products like bottle cages and water bottles. Um, we, 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 we pride our, our product and we protect our product uh, through patents, through registered design. Um, it's a process that involves uh, energy and money, but uh, 
uh, it's uh, it's basically in a nutshell we've got a an attorney base just focused on protecting our our patents our designs and our and our products so will it ever happen yes it's a possibility uh, but we feel strong that we can we can protect our our product and our ideas and our technology and you've clearly taken a decision that in marketing terms it's more important for the consumers to know and exactly understand what the technique for measuring power is. You've clearly decided that the benefits of doing that outweigh the risks of this technology being, being copied or stolen. In order even to explain uh, the certificate that we have, because sometimes you can wave a piece of paper to people saying plus minus whatever percent in our case, 1%, uh, is simple. You also have to explain how you achieve that and through which instrument you achieve that. So. We're, we're, we're proud, absolutely, uh, to say we have the most precise trainer and this is how it happens. These trainers are expensive, very expensive, but you can begin to understand where some of the costs lie. Elite had to buy the licence for the technology. They have to pay for lawyers to protect it. They test every single driver that leaves the head office, and we'll hear more about that later in the podcast. And the trainers themselves are heavy things that have to be shipped around the world. But it's encouraging to hear that plans are afoot to get this precise technology into lower priced trainers. Anyway, with a cast of senior elite folk lined up, I had to tackle one of the questions around the Drivo. It's caught a lot of flack for its looks, and many people think that could be mitigated or even solved by making the casing black instead of its current beige colour. The core is black, and it looks better in black, guys. You know, the, the driver would look better in black, and there's lots of, there's lots of knowing smiles here. Um, did you think about producing it in black? Peter, I'll, I'll put you on the spot first. The question is, Simon, do you like blondes or redheads? <laughs> Depends. Uh, it's a point of distinction. Uh, I also was not a big white fan, uh, white case fan, I'll be honest. But looking at the last trade shows that I've done from Eurobike, Innerbike, uh, to the Relay Classic, I must say it does stand out. And we're going to talk to, to Julio in much more detail later on, but, but Julio is the boss of the company and he's, he's here too, taking a, an interest in as you'd expect in, in everything that's been said. Julio, where do you stand on the, on the white v black debate? I prefer black. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, you see. You get the... Destroyed everything I can. Uh, <laughs> the, the marketing man is looking, looking horrified, but uh, you got a straight answer from Julio there. Oh, do you know what, guys? I felt like I got real insight into the company on this visit. Not, not just the products, which you obviously do, but the kind of culture of the company and what type of company they are and what type of people they are. And I, I came away feeling very, very positive about Elite. I have to say, I think they they genuinely care about what they do. They're a, they're a family company. That, um, I was talking to one of the guys in the car when, when we were going between locations and he said, um, I asked him how long people generally work there. And he said, well, they come here and um, generally if, if they last four weeks, they could well be here 40 years. I don't think we see too many uh, jobs for life these days, but I, th I think if you, if you get on well at Elite, you, you've got a job for life. And that, that's a really nice thing about a company like that, I think. Anyway, um, one of the interesting things was an understanding of, or, 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 or uh, beginning to understand why these things cost what they do. And there's a lot of stuff, Shane, in, in trainers that we don't see, isn't it, that goes into the price. So people look at the price and say, my God, that's expensive. But, but it's, it's, it can be tough sometimes to get an understanding of, of exactly what goes into the price. It's not just the plastic case and the metal bits that go round and round. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, the traditional trainer we used to have was just a simple mechanical object with a roller and a few bearings and quite a cheap object. It phase shifted very, very quickly to the smart trainer and the, the price apparently went through the, or appeared to go through the roof. There's a reason for that. The trainers we're now using these days have more technology in them than our bikes. 
probably even the DI2 bikes. It's quite a simple setup for DI2, but our indoor trainers with the power meters built in, with all the electronics, with Ant Plus, um, we have uh, Bluetooth, we have all these additional heat sensors built in. There's just so much that goes into these trainers that we don't see because they're all packed up into one box. Um, so yeah, and um, even a post that I put up the other week about the FCC teardowns of this. If you're going to sell something in the US, it's got to be submitted to the FCC um, for a full inspection of the uh, radiation it transmits out. So the paperwork for that, um, there is there's a ton of overheads. At the end of the day, we just want to ride our bikes. It's quite simple. You push the pedals, isn't it? That's easy. Um, but yeah, behind the scenes, so much going on. So yeah, it was fascinating to hear your behind the scenes look at that uh, for, with Elite. Do you think the oh, it's a really hard question this Nathan and kind of why would you know really but but do you think these things are fairly priced there's a Brian Regan comedy set scene that's uh about fridges and you know here's a here's a fridge for two hundred dollars and that it'll keep your food cold for two hundred dollars and here's a fridge four hundred it'll keep your food cold for four hundred dollars and here's uh this one with silver and twelve hundred dollars it'll keep your food cold I mean so We'll get the job done. There's that. So so whether or not a lot goes in in the background to keeping food cold or you riding your bike with a smart trainer doesn't really matter, I think, to the market is whether or not it's fairly priced. Now, with that said, I'm all about quality. I go for the high end immediately. I've said that over and over on the SwiftCast. Do my research up front, and I'm going to get something that's going to last a long time. I do that with all the products I get. I like quality for sure. So being fairly priced, I think many times up front is about a feeling in the market. And I think right now we're getting maybe a little bit past the feeling point um, where it's like, wow, that's a lot of money. What are, oh, I don't know about that. But then the market gets to know what they're getting out of the price. So now that we're hearing the precision that goes into the quality and not just buying a brand name or a look, but real hands-on quality and engineering will be felt by the consumer. And I have always felt I got a fair price on a quality that panned out over years of use rather than purchasing again within six months to a year on under engineering. And I think in this market, shelf life will really matter quite a bit more as the trainer is very interactive with a personal experience where you are in the heat of battle or a workout and putting in sacrifice and then it's failing on you or it's an amazing experience that you had in this immersive game or even just in your experience of maybe not with Zwift with whatever software you might be using and you're like wow that was really awesome maybe feel this real world feel or it failed on you in the middle of that yeah yeah absolutely okay well let's uh, take a deep dive oh, God, I do sound like Rare Maker this week don't I let's take a deep dive into one of the biggest mysteries on Zwift how does the draft work and more importantly what have recent changes done to it? Take a listen to this. The familiar sounds of a Zwift pack in full flight. But how do pack dynamics and the draft really work? Only a charmed circle deep within ZHQ know the details. But we do know that the draft is often tweaked. We've had the sticky draft when it was often hard to get past a slower rider. That's fixed. And recently, with the big growth in Swifters, we've seen some slightly weird behaviour with riders driven off the road, cycling through the sea or caught the wrong side of the undersea tunnel. That too looks to have been fixed. But perhaps as a result, we're also seeing some protests from lighter riders who are claiming that the latest tweaks to the draft and pack dynamics are really hurting them. Andrew Williams is one of those riders. I joined the platform early January 2015. It was still beta at that. Andrew races on Zwift, and he's a solid A rider, with a race average of four to four and a half watts per kilo. But he's light. I'm 60 kilos. And he's certain the latest tweaks are penalising him. I'm seeing guys with a B and a C attached to them that are going past me. That never used to happen. And I found myself just getting shuffled to the back. And then once I was in the back, it was as if there was no draft at all. One explanation is that Andrew has simply lost fitness, but he races outside as well as on Zwift. He's got a coach and he's experienced enough to know where his condition is. But if you're used to having a certain level of performance and you You've experienced that over several years, doing it in this virtual environment, and then suddenly it's just not there anymore. If you can point um, a finger at yourself and say, well, I haven't actually lost any fitness, then something must have changed. So what has changed? 
Andrew thinks a clue might be found in the increasing speeds of big packs on Zwift. So I can only make a guess, and I don't want to put any more weight on it than just a single person's guess. And my guess is that they have used sort of an additive thing where you get into the draft, it applies some kind of benefit to you, you know, making you go faster for per uh, unit watt, and then that, that just gets multiplied by the number of people that are in there somehow, and then that makes the entire group go faster. And so what I've noticed is that people who are in the front, who are literally in the front, there's no one in front of them. They're going, you know, 55 kph, and they're putting out four watts per kilogram, which is, you know, that I'm sorry to tell you, but that just doesn't happen in real life. I mean, Christian Wiedemann is a race organizer, group ride leader, and a racer. He thinks the explanation for increasing pack speeds may be a good deal more simple. I feel at least for me, I don't notice any major change in the algorithm. Um, what I have noticed is there are a lot more people on the road. And the result of that is that the, the riders at the front of the bunch have draft more, much more often than they used to when there were only a few hundred people on on the road at the same time. The, the bigger packs are continuously catching up to other riders and as a result there's nobody who's actually pushing against the wind. Everybody has a draft. So Christian believes that the lack of clear air as the platform gets more crowded is having a real effect on pack speeds. But Andrew has an idea that other things might be going on under the hood. There's a possibility, he believes, that Zwift is actively shaping the pelotons. They've tried to make it look more real because I've noticed that at the same time that this problem has happened, there is this sort of pace lining appearance where the, the pack, and especially if it's a large pack, will string out into this long and very regular line of riders as opposed to what it used to be, which is this big clump. Again, Christian is not convinced by this theory. I don't believe that there is something in there that tries to adjust riders' speeds just to make the pack be a certain shape. Uh, I personally believe that it's, it's just the dynamic factors of their model. I think if they were really shaping the pack, the packs would probably look very different and you won't get the, these snakes dodging from one side to the road, off the road to the other um, that you see now. But Andrew isn't the only lighter rider to complain about what's happening with pack sizes, speeds, shapes, and how they get on in races. Christian thinks this can be accounted for by the simple physics of how Zwift works. I think lighter riders are complaining simply because lighter riders are disadvantaged where the draft has most effect, which means on the flats. You know, they have to hold a higher watt per kilogram uh, or a higher power to weight ratio in, in order to keep up. And if the front isn't being slowed down, they essentially have to hold the same power that the front is holding. And I think my personal feeling is that the, the packs are definitely faster now than they were three months ago. Uh, but my feeling also is that that is pretty proportional to the amount of riders that are on the road now. Whatever is going on deep within the mechanics of the draft, and we'll probably never know what that is, Andrew accepts that is something of a voice in the wilderness, given that lighter riders are almost certainly a minority of Zwift users. The majority of riders actually prefer the way it is now. Um, it seems like the majority of riders are actually heavier. The needs of the many, you know, it's the Spock thing. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Uh, Nathan, I think it is one of the seven wonders of the world, isn't it? Or one of the seven mysteries of the universe, the draft. Well, I mean, we have no idea really how it works uh, and I thought that was so interesting hearing from Andrew there I mean have you seen this in racing I've seen a lot of frustration uh, from the racers uh, because all of a sudden they have to sprint to catch back up because they've completely lost the pack in some sort of way or lost track of the pack in some sort of a way uh, the idea of there's no wall of air and I, I've heard about this I tried testing this a little bit and I I personally couldn't find it. I uh, didn't really see it. Well, at the same time, I have seen this odd thing where someone coming by me right now, though, does seem to go faster 
than me after they've been drafting off of me. But that's almost maybe a little bit of a real world effect, though. I don't know if you're you're taking real world out of it because if I'm drafting on someone, right, and uh, in the real world, and then they uh, they move over, I come through. I'm gonna feel like I've got more speed than they do as I come through. There's gonna be they, they just it all not just feel it actually happens all the time. Well, you'll have momentum. Yeah, and so it's a common thing on group rides where you have people maybe who not quite much experience or just want to use that draft and come right on by because of and 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 cause this continual surgence in the group uh, after drafting for a while, and so um, that's where you get a lot of complaining. I think in the group rides actually they're going too fast after somebody takes a poll. So, but I I'm not sure if that's even there. I'm just wondering. I did sense something, but I uh, I don't have anything verified from my personal experience. Yeah, something's going on. This one, we're still trying to figure out what's going on before we can test what's going on. So we're still, I think if there's any changes to the draft, I think Swift need to be really transparent about what they've changed, what they're trying to optimize. So people in that category, be it, look, we've changed drafting for a lighter rider or heavier riders, or we're doing this for people near the front. Then we're more conscious about what to look for and our experience. For me personally, the bunt riding has never been what I thought it would be. Um, going back two years, okay, I've got a smart trainer. I'm going to be pushing a lot of watts on the front. And if I'm not on the front, I'm just going to be ticking along easy. You've seen it in the Tour de France, um, even along the Champs Elysees, the, the sprinters' trains are lined out. They're going flat out, single file, and the, the bunch sort of fans out at the back. But there's guys at the back just sort of freewheeling. It's not like that on Zwift. It still is a, a pretty much a time trial effort, and you don't feel that backing off of resistance when the aerodynamics changes. But this is going to be a tough one for them to solve. It'll always be a really tough one because even saying you know bunch ride dynamics, well, a bunch strung out is totally different to a bunch grouped. Um, and then you say you have two trains going, then you, you have two lead out trains um, or you know, sprint trains. Um, that's going to be harder again. So I just think going back to my original statement there was I think they need to be a bit more transparent with the user base because we're a really, really good group of testers and have some good feedback uh, about any changes that's going on because that way we can all feedback and have a better experience for the newbies coming on board and going, oh, I really have to, you know, how to, you know, working out how to ride in a bunch. That's one thing you do have to upskill on when you get on the platform is how to actually stay within the bunch. It also, it's also like, here's what we're working on. It's something to look forward to, I think, rather than, oh, this is what's happening. It's like, oh, this is something that is under construction. Great. There's This is coming. You know what I mean? This is an advancement that we're looking forward to. I think that's the way I would look at it is like, oh, I can't wait for that to come down the road. You know, so uh, I think that's a great, here's what we're currently working on is a great uh, talking point for Zwift and the user base. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge that, the way that the draft works is, is probably the most secret bit of all of Zwift's secret source. So I, I don't think any of us are saying that, that they should, you know, print the code. Uh, but I agree with both of you. It would be nice just to see some discussions maybe initiated by Zwift uh, uh, about the nature of changes made to the draft and, and what they expect those to do and you know is there a way of, of the user base feeding back on whether those expectations have been met with with the, with the tweaks that they're making it would be good to see that I, I do agree okay uh, let's nip back to Italy now um, as, as Shane uh, pointed out just a few moments ago uh, uh, interactive trainers are complicated things these days they're not just an A-frame anymore with a resistance unit bolted on their technologically sophisticated gadgets. And as a result of that, QC or quality control is a huge area of concern for trainer manufacturers. If they get it wrong, it's big trouble. Uh, if they get it right, no one notices, but 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 it, it, it pays dividends for them because they don't get like tons of trainers sent back to them and people squealing on social media that they're awful. Um, so it was very interesting to be taken inside Elite's QC process. If you're spending a four-figure sum on a smart trainer, you've got a reasonable expectation that it's going to be accurate. But you also expect it to be robust mechanically, well-built, sturdy and reliable. The trainer manufacturers check their products before they're shipped, the process known as QC or QA, Quality Control or Quality Assurance. 
and elites were very happy to let me see their process. We've just walked into the QC, the Quality Control Department, and this is a much more buzzy environment because there's lots of machines running. Uh, and every single trainer with the OTS power device, power measurement device, is tested for 45 minutes. And we're going to wander over to a machine here which is testing the Drivo. And the way that this works is that the Drivo has got its case taken off, it's running, it's attached to a crankshaft which is uh, simulating the rotation that you would put in on the pedals and you take a reading from the Drivo which is cross-referenced with a reading from a professional power meter along the crankshaft which I can I can see here which is a very impressive looking box and uh, there's a guy looking intently at some sets of numbers on the screen here and I can see that the trainer is running at 885 watts and the independent power meter that's uh, looking at the same wattage is is showing 882 watts and that is a variation of 0.28 percent which is pretty impressive I'm uh, Alessandro Faronato. I'm a quality manager of Elite. We check uh, at 100% the our home trainer. Uh, above all, uh, interactive home trainer. We check in three or four times during all process of production. At the beginning, uh, during the assembling. Uh, after that, uh, we uh, check uh, the core of the home trainer without uh, cover, without plastic part, and uh, we check the hardware, uh, the functionality, the absence of noise, absence of vibration. What, what do you do if you find one that's outside acceptable limits? Uh, uh, if uh, if uh, something is uh, out of uh, our uh, expective, uh, we usually uh, keep uh, uh, in all the, this uh, single piece uh, and open study uh, which uh, uh, why it is uh, not uh, qualified for example if there are some vibration we uh, change the flywheel for example or uh, if uh, it has uh, some noise uh, we check uh, the bearings and i saw evidence of this a wooden crate had a number of units that had obviously failed qc this was a busy area. It's perhaps an index of both how rigorous is the QC and how many trainers elite are selling on the back of the Zwift boom that this department runs two shifts a day, seven days a week. And again, you begin to understand why these things cost quite so much. But it strikes me that the policy of testing every single trainer that's sold is one that must add a good deal of cost to your process. I would imagine a lot of other engineering operations would be happy with, with a random spot check. Anything that's interactive, where there's a combination of hardware, electronics, integration with not only elite software, but third-party software, our protocol says 100% control. Peter Largo, the sales guy. Clearly, there is a cost. Uh, Alessandro wants to be paid end month, his team wants to be paid end month, but. It, it's a it's, uh, part of that added value, in our opinion, that uh, certifies that the product gets out of here in perfect condition. And that's fundamental, especially when you're declaring to the market a position of plus minus 1% uh, for, for the power measurements. Um, it's, it's a marketing. I, I look at it as a marketing uh, investment uh, where you can yell out to the market that you have a precise product and it's, uh, and it's been checked one by one. Uh, and looking around this place, it, it, it is extremely difficult not to be not to be pretty impressed. Actually, uh, there are machines running, there are people looking at screens, and there's bike wheels rotating at all kinds of different speeds all over the place. It's uh, it's a pretty impressive setup. Shane, checking one by one. I, I mean, I was absolutely staggered by that. 
Yep, brilliant. And as we said before, what goes into the cost behind the scenes, that's an added cost as well. But that's going to that's gonna save them a lot of money if they know and they're very confident in their product that every single one of those um, devices is accurate and will work um, straight out of the box. Not only does it save them for the current model that they've got, but the next model and the model after, the internet has a really, really long memory. Um, again, to mention the other company we discussed before, um, I was discussing, you know, what trainers should somebody get? And I said, well, if you want silence, it's the Neo. And their first hesitation to me was, oh, there was problems with the Neo. I thought, oh, that's right. Now I got on, I got on the Neo boat, you know, probably six months after they'd fixed all those problems, but that was still there and lingering. So it's really good. And it's imperative. These companies do that kind of testing, um, for these devices that we do give pretty, a pretty hard time. I mean, some of us are knocking out 1,400 to 1,500 watts. That's a lot of energy that's going through effectively a computer. So, um, yeah, no, really, really good to see. And um, by all, um, all reports from my Drivo, it's held up to those kind of efforts. Yeah, I mean, it, there's absolutely no doubt it's, an, it's a fantastically accurate trainer. But th this raises a question, I think, for us, though, Nathan. You know, as Swift gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we've seen real evidence of that in the past few days. Um, are we, do you think, going to lose sight of the importance of accuracy? Um, you know, the, the new people might not, and I, I don't mean to patronise them here, but, but then that might not be as concerned or, or even care as much about a super accurate trainer than the people who've been on the platform for a while and realise how important an accurate trainer is if you're going to use Swift as a proper training tool and if you're going to use it as a competitive space. Do, do you think there's a risk that accuracy is just going to be consigned to the, you know, few percent of people who are happy to pay crazy amounts of money for the best trainer on the market? I think before Zwift, it was all about accuracy, actually, for serious athletes and not so much for the casual user. The serious athlete, athlete was the one that was willing to be on a trainer, and I think that trainers were focused on that. And uh, I think we're going to end up with casual player and competitive player. I don't think it'll actually divide the community. I think it'll just celebrate both parts of the community really well and help them interact better if we are able to identify them well and serve them well. If we don't and we mix them too much, I think that's where we'll get a problem when we try and call casual and competitive the same thing. I think that's where we get into trouble because we're unable to differentiate our expectations and our desires in the game. I do think the interesting thing about Zwift is, uh, you know, oh, we're getting very theoretical today, is that it's kind of democratized power so almost kind of the first thing that people ask after how do i turn is is what is all this ftp then and why is it important sort of taking an umbrella view just getting the vibe of are we talking too technical for the kind of audience that are now coming on board so i'll be monitoring that just um, from my personal experience i guess because i'm across all you know ctl um you know training peaks the whole works and all the three letter acronyms you can throw at everything um that's sort of been my last 10 years in the sport itself but i'm really conscious of what is the experience of someone coming in throwing all these acronyms at them and they just want to ride a bike um but again back to the accuracy i'm all about the numbers again so from a personal point of view i love the accuracy and i hope that everything's just going to be brought into line because one watt is a measurable known accurate uh, me unit of measure um it's not 1.1 it's not 9.5 or 0.59 it's one watt. Um, and it's really good to see Elite um, really focus on this. And I think Elite have actually listened to the community and done their research and gone, look, we don't want to have to deal with all of that. We'll solve it and we'll move on. OK, let's uh, let's wrap this one up here. Now, it's the last podcast before Christmas. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Um, he who must not now be mentioned, um, the Lance, the Lance creature, uh, 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 allegedly always trained on Christmas Christmas Day. Uh, mainly, I think he was once quoted as saying, because his rivals didn't. Um, I always set out with the best of intentions of doing some exercise on Christmas Day, but generally the day kind of runs away with me. Uh, will you guys be riding Christmas Day, Nathan? I'll probably be riding late at night, both Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We have, I think, four or five Christmases that we do with the family. We've got a large family. We've got five kiddos. And it's the one few couple of days where there's nothing going on where I can sneak in some longer rides. So I'll probably be riding my, my first initial big base rides, actually, 
uh, over Christmas. That's actually almost a tradition around here since I started riding the trainer for long hours uh, prior to Zwift even. So yeah, I'll be riding for sure. It's kind of the kick into the season for me because of the break from everything else. I mean, Shane, obviously Christmas in Australia is very different from the Northern Hemisphere. So I'm guessing it's easier for you to, to ride a bike. Oh, look, it absolutely is. And uh, so Christmas Day, Veronica and I, my wife, we usually ride between two towns because we have Christmas lunch in Horsham. We have Christmas uh, dinner in Japarit, very small country town. Um, and it's 88 kilometres into a stinking hot headwind. If you've ever watched Mad Max, it's pretty close to that environment. It was filmed <laughs> oh near, near that area. And I am not joking. I will put up shots on my Instagram. Don't worry about that. So we'll be doing that do Christmas wear, Day. Do you wear a mullet while you do this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And full leathers and guitars that shoot flames. Actually, no, it's a total fire ban. We can't start fires. It's too hot for that. Have a great Christmas, guys. Uh, happy holidays, we say to Americans, don't we, Nathan? Yeah, definitely uh, happy holidays for sure. Um, and Merry Christmas as well. So, And a happy New Year to everybody. Yeah, yeah. And what's the standard greeting in, in Oz, Shane? Just happy Christmas? No, it's just g'day, mate. It's still the same every single day. <laughs> no, it's Christmas over here as well. But funnily enough, we do we do celebrate a white Christmas. I grew up as a kid with white Santa and reindeers and snow and and all the the snow. I never understood it. We really didn't get what it all meant until we learned about oh, it's different, you know, hemispheres and different. So we still have this, which is kind of weird. It's coming around though. We're sort of having more barbecues and uh, singlets and beers and things like that. You know, the standard Australian uh, thing was sort of coming around. It's still a white Christmas here in Australia. Well, listen, have a great uh, have a great break. And it's always a lovely family time, so um, enjoy that. And uh, uh, to all the Zwiftcast listeners as well, have happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Thank you very much for listening this year. Lots of new, interesting and, oh, God, possibly even controversial things coming up next year. If, if, if a new theme tune could possibly be described as controversial. But there's a bit of a makeover for the podcast coming up uh, in January, which is all very exciting. Uh, and I look forward to debating it on the Zwiftcast listeners group with anybody who's interested. Um, thank you very much, guys. As ever, fab talking to you. Uh, thank you for everything this year as well. I've, I've, I, I so look forward to these chats we have about this silly cycling game we're all completely obsessed with. Yep. Who would have thought we'd be talking about this uh, two or three years ago? We're talking, we have a, a weekly show about pixel bikes. That's bizarre, but I love it. So, um, yeah, thanks for the listeners. Thanks, Nathan and Simon. It's uh, It's been a great year. And, uh, yeah, let's just, I can't even imagine what's coming next year. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, happy New Year. Merry Christmas. And uh, happy chasing pixels. <laughs>